This is Joseph from Humble You Media, and in this video, I want to change things up a bit. Usually, I'm covering Carl Jung's red and black books, but I want to get into the man himself. So I found some quotes of his memories, we'll call them, of his essence, that he was speaking with a French author. And in these quotes, we'll see how Jung felt years after the red and black books in the year 1941. And we'll begin with the French author, Suzanne Percheron, as she says to Jung, Everything that you say has in me an immediate resonance. What X writes interests me, but you are something else, Jung, because it is the truth, a force of nature that expresses itself through me. I am only a channel. I don't oppose myself to expression, therefore, several times I have said definite things that I didn't know and that I forgot it once after having said them. I let it enter. That's the objective attitude. I can imagine myself in many instances where I would become sinister to you. For instance, if life had led you to take up an artificial attitude, then you wouldn't be able to stand me because I am a natural being. By my very presence, I crystallize. I am a ferment. The unconscious of people who live in an artificial manner senses me as a danger. Everything about me irritates them. My way of speaking. My way of laughing. They sense nature. Life, even at best, can force one to take this or that route. One must be sure to live it, but this could lead you into being artificial. Truth can be cruel, useless. One must not always tell it. One must tell it when it can be useful, when it can do good. Truth can drive crazy. We must not gauge this by our own vigor. You may become a little less sturdy, and then you cannot stand it anymore. One must be very prudent, full of precautions. There are few people who are truly interesting. One calls them interesting. They are valuable in one narrow area. That's the folly of an education that puts stress on ability rather than on humanity. The result is a lack of human beings. One wants to bring out the talent. You have a nice voice. Become a tenor. And they then strive to become that only. That is their folly. As for me, I have always done my utmost to be a human being. Already at school, they were astonished when I wrote a good essay because I loved sports and occasionally got drunk. Inside himself, a man depends on his reputation. One must not damage him there. A woman also has her own reputation, but it is in a different area. It is concerned more with her personal role, her role at home. A man's situation is different. To recognize a great error can be fatal for him because by this he risks losing his authority. I, for instance, if in certain manners my wife would notice my errors, or if she showed me that she notices them, I would be afraid of my wife, because then she shows me that I have not been conscious. Suzanne then adds, But you would at least like to know this. Jung. Yes provided that it is not too strong, and perhaps also that it comes from myself. That is why women need to be extremely diplomatic. That is a very difficult role for them, because one must not subsidize the fantasies of others. Certain women make weaklings of their husbands, without authority, flaccid. Others make them inflated. It is a very delicate balance. It is above all in this area, that women are perspective. On some other points, one can show them their weakness, but as a general rule, one cannot demonstrate to a surgeon that he has killed his patient or that he has botched an operation. Men are less vulnerable in their quality as father, husband. There, women are most susceptible. Women are a magical force. They surround themselves with an emotional tension stronger than the rationality of men. 
A man cannot create the atmosphere of a home. He can disturb the atmosphere, but he cannot create it. The atmosphere of a home depends above all on the woman. Woman is a very strong being, magical. That's why I'm afraid of women. Suzanne then asks, I suppose that you dream. Jung answers, no, I almost don't dream anymore. I used to dream when I began to discover my unconscious. One dreams when the unconscious has something to say, but my consciousness is always so receptive now that the door is open. I am ready to accept. With me, the unconscious can flow into consciousness. I no longer have prejudice or fear or resistance. The dream is a way in which the unconscious makes itself known to consciousness. Many people have no memory of their dreams because the unconscious knows that it will not be heard. So what's the use? Then they don't remember. To this, Suzanne asks, how could one bring this about in France? An evolution towards the recognition of unconscious life. Jung answers, I know only one way, through psychology. Perhaps there are other ways by and by. Everything happens in such small ways, invisibly. One does not notice it. Take the time when Christ was on earth, or the time of the Buddha. For their contemporaries, it was only by and by, bit by bit that something was achieved. Suzanne asks, a practical question. How, when one wants to tell someone something, can one avoid doing harm? Jung answers, that is a question of great taste, of tact, of discernment. On the whole, when there is a complete unconsciousness, don't say anything. The shock would be too great. Unconsciousness is not complete when there is embarrassment or any kind of reaction. For instance, when someone is sitting with a snake under his armchair, one must warn him gently, but sometimes it is better not to give a warning. The intuitives who construct daydreams which follow their fancy, with these intuitives who construct daydreams, there develops, of necessity, an inferiority complex, and in order to make up for it, more and more daydreams are necessary. Naturally, these intuitive spirits also have great charm and a certain power because they seduce others whom it would pay to stay on the ground, but who listen to them and are seduced. In reality, hurt and danger are reinforced. On earth, one must become substance. Suzanne asks, how can one remedy this? Jung, simply by becoming conscious of it. By confirming the fact, not by avoiding it. One must, out of necessity, require this understanding. Suzanne then adds, But then one is unhappy. One should not have to be shown by someone else. Jung, one must not avoid unhappiness. One must accept suffering. It is a great teacher. Suzanne, but happiness too. I don't think that I avoid unhappiness. And I have learned much by observing my suffering. But I have learned much from happiness, and I seek it. Jung. There, that's an error. One must not seek happiness. The happiness that one seeks is a usurped one. Organic happiness. The bliss that comes from the center of the earth. That alone is fruitful. And that simply comes. Sometimes it surges from the deepest suffering. Let me quote Nietzsche's verse of who in the greatest depth of his suffering cries suddenly, the world, has it become perfect? Such bliss did he feel. One must not seek happiness. One must not avoid suffering. When one distances oneself too much from suffering, one loses depth, and happiness comes from depth. Intuitives don't have substance. They have inventiveness imagination. They don't complete anything. It is necessary for them to acquire this faculty. Suzanne asks, I don't want to become too wise. Haven't you ever been afraid of becoming too wise? Jung, as Jung would answer, not me. I have always desired it. 
You, you talk about something rigid and austere, but austerity goes with an artificial notion of wisdom. The wiser one is, the happier one is. Wisdom, that is a gift of nature. It's joyous laughter, Chinese bellies. It's the art of living. Wisdom comes from folly. When one is wise, one loves everything, but in moderation. One finds that the extremes are too costly. It's the same line. One finds oneself on the same line, but one does not go too far because excesses must be paid for. Austerity is also in the realm of nature, the forest, the mountains. But without insistence, nature never insists on its qualities. And to do this means, in fact, to lose the quality of one's quality. It no longer is nature, no longer natural. One insists on one's qualities because at that moment, one is identified with one's quality. One believes one is that. Let flow that which emanates from you without insisting, without purpose. Otherwise, one has a dissatisfaction with oneself. So to conclude this video, I want to add my own notes. We'll call them footnotes to expand on some of these points that Jung just spoke on. So the first note brings us all the way back to the beginning of this rare quote, where Jung speaks about a force of nature that comes through him, and he calls it truth. So it's this truth that individuation leads us to, an objective state. He called himself a channel, and anybody could be this channel if they do that inner work, if they go through their individuation journey. The only thing about individuation is for those that aren't individuated, you have an effect on them. So next I want to talk about individuation and the effect you have on others, the artificial. And if you think of our times, which could be the most artificial of them all, you'll notice that this reaction is so true. Jung speaking such truth here. Because individuation is that journey of allowing that truth that we just spoke on to come through. And if another is a tyrant of an ego and they suppress their soul, they suppress their self, they don't allow the wholeness to come through because they're living their illusion, then that space automatically reacts when it sees somebody that's speaking that truth, that's individuated or at least individuating. And I love this because you could see that others around you, if you're walking this journey, if you're just beginning the journey in the future, if you see others around you react in this manner because of the work that you're doing, you at least know that it's not them consciously thinking. It's not them consciously hating you. It's more or less an unconscious reaction. Jung says he doesn't dream anymore. He doesn't dream as much, at least. And I've noticed this too, as I continue on my individuation journey, my dreams at night aren't as prevalent. Now, if you think in terms of energy, and you think of the unconscious as potential energy, and you think of consciousness as kinetic energy, you could see how if one is a ego, like a true tyrant of an ego, and isn't looking within, that all that potential doesn't have any route to come through, doesn't have any space to come out. Now, when someone goes to sleep, the tyrant goes to sleep, they crack the door open, and that's when dreams become prevalent. And I think, could be wrong, but I think if you're doing the work, you're releasing some of that potential energy so that there isn't as much energy trapped in you. And because of that, you're not dreaming as much at night. So to conclude this video, I want to talk about the idea of happiness because we see Suzanne saying she's chasing happiness and then Jung snaps right back at her, that sinister type saying, you cannot chase happiness. It has to come through. You can't go grasp it. And then I'll have people, this is a beautiful example, people say, well, Joseph, when I go to the beach, I've caught happiness. I've chased it and then I feel it in the moment. So I've caught it. I can go after it if I'm going to sit on the beach, if I go put myself in a situation that makes me happy. But then I say, wait a second, why don't we go sit on the beach for a year straight, 365 days. And if you're still the same way, you still have those same emotions, then you've caught it. But if not, then you could see it's illusion. Because in that one moment when you haven't been there, when you're stressed and you feel a little bit more relaxed, you may feel a sense of happiness. 
But then if you're still there and you're not noticing that same happiness, then obviously it didn't bring it to you. So you wanna look within, you wanna look within for the emotions. You can't go chase happiness, you can't go chase anger. Imagine I said, hey, I'm gonna go chase anger today. You think I've hit my head. But then we know a lot of people that spend their lives chasing happiness. So I love that Jung brings this up. And I also have to say that suffering is a great teacher. But to conclude this video, I wanna end on that final quote that I've ended the video with. As Jung says, to let flow that which emanates through you without insisting or without purpose. Otherwise, one has a dissatisfaction with oneself.